some more, bro. I mean, we just keep going if y'all feel good. I don't know. I feel the spirit of worship in the house tonight. We got a song to sing. I mean, we have a song to sing. We don't have a song. I'm just saying. But um, something special is happening tonight. You know, I walk in, even this morning, something special is happening in Boulder. I feel like God's moving. I feel like God is desperate to hear the praises of his people when we come together. I don't know if y'all feel that in the house tonight as well. Let's pray. Let's, let's pray and let's, let's just send it. Wait, are you going? You got a song? I, got, I, I don't want a song either. I just want to keep singing. I don't want to shut it down. All right. Since I don't have a song, let's send it after. Let's pray. Father, we love you so much. Father, we know that you delight in hearing the praises of your people. Father, your scripture references that a sweet aroma. So, Father, we come together not just to check something off of a box today, but we come together with fully surrendered, open hands, open hearts, wanting to follow where you lead. Spirit, move. Do what I cannot. Do what we cannot. Speak to us. Meet us where we are. Change and transform lives, Father. We feel your presence here when we ask for more. So move in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Hey, you can have a seat. Or are you going to stand up? No, I'm just kidding. I'm joking. No, I'm joking. I'm playing. No, go ahead and have a seat. And thank you guys so much for coming at 4 p.m. Here at the lookout, you guys look great tonight. It's a beautiful day here in Boulder, Colorado. Anybody else getting the summer itch? Big time. There's nothing like a Boulder summer. My favorite season in Boulder. Hands down the summer. Love skiing, love snowboarding. Nothing like a Boulder summer. <laughs> but I'm feeling that. Excited to get out. I'm spending more time with friends. Out in this beautiful weather as well. Fam, we're excited to be kicking off. I think it's going to be the best series that we've ever had in the history of Pinewood. <laughs> I know that's setting the bar high. What's up, everybody online? Super glad you're watching here as well. Are you ready for the best series that we've ever had in the history of Pinewood Church? I think we're leaning into the most important question that anybody could ever ask. What are you here for? What on earth are you doing on this planet? What's the meaning of your life? Is there really any significance or are we just kind of going about day to day? What are we here for? Another way to say that is, what's your purpose? And we're going to hopefully over the next five to six weeks, maybe longer, we're going to hope help you answer that question and hopefully give you some practical handles around how you can live every single day with purpose and meaning in your life. Does that sound good? Come on, let's go. We got some clappers in the house. It's okay to clap. Romans 14, 7 through 9. If you have your Bibles, we're going to start off right there. Romans 14, 7 through 9. We've been working our way through the New Testament together in our daily reading. And then we come together on Sundays. And I do my best. And our preaching team, we do our best to preach some of the passages that we've studied from the last week. So we're going to be looking at Romans 14, just two verses tonight, and then we're going to talk about them. Romans 14, 7 through 9, says this. For we don't live for ourselves or die for ourselves. If we live, it's to honor the Lord. If we die, it's to honor the Lord. So it's pretty clear right there. It's not us. It's about Him. So whether we live... Or die, we belong to the Lord. Christ died and rose again for this very purpose to be Lord both of the living and of the dead. 
So we're going to be talking about what are you here for? What's your purpose? And there's, as I began to think about this idea and this question, I thought about a book that changed my life. And it made a profound influence. Many of you have probably read it. How many of you have ever heard of Rick Warren, Purpose Driven Life? Anybody ever read, heard that book? That's a lot of people. It's because it's an extremely popular book. Pastor Rick Warren is a pastor out in California. He wrote this book hope, seeking to help people with this incredible and most significant question. This book has sold over 35 million copies. Isn't that incredible? I know that I've given my copy out to at least a dozen people and said, you have to read this. Give it back to me when you're done, though. I'm going to give it to somebody else. So, I mean, think, if it's been out, divvied out to 35 million people, 35 million people sold, how many millions of people has this book affected? It's in 70 different languages as well. So it has had a global impact. It is one of the best-selling nonfiction books in history. That's pretty incredible. Now, why do I tell you all that? Well, because there was something about the title. There was something about the question that obviously drew in millions and millions of people to say, yeah, I, I've been asking myself the same thing. I'm kind of desperate for the answers. The question is not specific to Christians. You know, those, some of those books that are like specific to Christians, like 21 ways that Christians can have, uh, you know, better discipline or something like that. Like, this book is not specific to Christians. This book is specific to all humanity, everybody, no matter what tribe, race, demographic, no matter what career you have, everybody is asking themselves the same thing. What on earth am I here for? For many, we go to books of self-help, self-care, and self-achievement. This book helps us with a different framework and points us back to God. Growing up, a lot of people asked me, what do you want to do when you get older? What do some of you want to do when you get older? What do you want to do now when you get older? <laughs> I'm trying to figure, what do I want to do when I get older? But as a kid, people would say, what do you want to do when you get older? And even as a little kid, you know, I kind of had an idea, but nobody really knows when they're a kid exactly what it is. And the uh, people in my church would always ask me, what do you think God's will is for your life? I don't really know. Trying to figure that out every single day. What do you think God's will is for your life? It's a question that we wrestle with, and I, I've honestly wrestled with it my whole life. So much so that even through college, I, I knew the trajectory. I knew that God had a calling in my life for pastoral ministry. But I remember I wrestled so deeply with this idea of like, and almost becoming anxious over every little decision over my life. Like, was that God's will? Well, if I date this person, is that God's will? If I say yes to this career... Is that God's will? And it really began to mess with me. I remember even reading just these giant books. One of the biggest books I've ever read is Decision Making the Will of God. It was this huge book that I actually I couldn't even hardly understand any of it. It was so deep. But I read it because I was desperate. And I think that's many of you here today as well. You're desperate to seek answers to the question, why am I here? And I want to start off the sermon the same way that Rick Warren started off his book. This is probably one of the most simple yet impactful statements I think I could ever make, ever. Like get out your notepads. Get out your iPhones. I'm about to say one single statement that will revolutionize your life. It's like throwing a boulder in a, in a creek that's going to have ripple effects. That's ripple effects that's going to affect generations to come. The people around you will be better and potentially know God more as a result of you writing down what I'm about to tell you. <laughs> I mean, this, I cannot possibly build this up anymore, this one single statement. You ready? It's not about you. All right. Come on. Somebody, somebody give God some praise. <laughs> Thank you. And, you know, it's not me. I didn't write it. Stole it straight from Pastor Rick. It's not about you. I want, us, I want us to, if you're comfortable with this, I just want us to just soak in this statement together. So 
we're going to say, it's not about me altogether. Are you ready? It's not about me. Doesn't that feel good? Doesn't that kind of take a little bit of a load off of your back? Let's do it one more time. It's not about me. That the purpose of your life is far greater than you. And really anything that you could even do, think, say, accomplish. Uh, it's greater than your successes, your failures, your achievements, how much money you have. It's greater than your health. God's purpose for your life is greater than you because it's not about you. You were born by his purpose, for his purpose. By his purpose, for his purpose. As we read in the passage, whether you live or whether you die, and whatever you do in between, because <laughs> how many of you know you're doing one of the two things? You're either living or you're dead, and in any situation, your life is to honor and glorify God. Therefore, you were born by his purpose, for his purpose. It's not about you. You were born for something so much more. Now, now even just right there, I, I think we shut this hammer down, bring the worship team back up, and just like lean into that during worship. God, okay, I get it. It's not about me. You have a big plan, purpose for my life. God, what do you have for me? But I want to keep taking it one step further. Whenever we think about the purpose and the meaning of our life, we typically have the wrong starting point. Typically, it is about us. Typically, it is about me. Our starting point is typically ourselves. I see this true even in my own amazing children, who since birth, since the time where they turned the wonderful twos, which, by the way, I love, twos are the best, threes are tough. Any amens out there? Threes are bad news, okay? I never had to tell my one, two, three, I never had to tell any of my kids, um, hey, guys, you should really think about you, you know? You're so concerned with others. You're so selfless. You're so generous. And never once. <laughs> no. No, because as a kid, everything is it's about me and my, my, my. What is that? Who is that? The my, 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 my. Isn't that a cartoon or something? Mine, 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 mine. Who? Nemo. Mine, 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 mine. Nemo. That's, that's really how kids grow up. Mine, mine, mine. And then you find two little kids that you're like, you're like y'all are going to be best friends. And you look over five minutes, they're like gouging each other's eyes. Mine. It's such a, I literally saw my children last night furious, just like fighting and then clenched fists and arm wrestling and punching each other. And I go in and I was like, what is going on? He has my Lego. I'm telling you, they have thousands of Legos. And Corey was holding on to this tiny little white piece. And he's like, it's mine. It's my Lego. I was like, oh, my gosh. I could spend five seconds in that giant bin of yours and find that exact same Lego. <laughs> but it's just how, it's, it's how we are. And for many of us, that's kind of how we were as a child. And nobody was like, hey, I love you so much. You know how much I love you? It's not about you. This life, you're great. You're amazing. But this life isn't about you. You know the world doesn't revolve around you? I want to teach you how much, at what level the world does not revolve around you. Many people don't grow up with that. Many people grow up with the opposite being affirmed and affirmed. Remember, oh, you don't want to eat that. Oh, you don't want to do that. Whatever you want. It's all about you. Whatever makes you happy. Whatever. And then this kid grows up and Teenager, and it's still whatever you want, whatever car you want. And then there just perpetuates this, it's all about me. Mine, mine, mine. And we were never discipled nor disciplined to have a different worldview that what if it's not about my dreams? What about if it's not my plan? What if it's not about just my career? I know that's really jacking with some of y'all's like, worldviews right now and just and just man I, I, are you sure because everything you're saying feels right but that's not how I live my life where do we turn when we're searching for life's greatest questions 
Where do we come from? I think it's a big one. I think it's important for all humanity to just say, where do we come from? I think there's a lot of how you ask that question that will determine a lot of other questions and views that you have of God. Um, how do we gauge morality? It's a big question. How do we know how to determine what is right and what is wrong and what is moral? Uh, for many people, that's, that doesn't matter. For many people, it's themselves, which, by the way, everyone has a different gauge of right and wrong. So I don't trust any of you guys to determine that for me. What about what's my purpose? Big question. Where do you go? Who do you turn to when you're asking your question, what's my purpose? Do you go to the stars? Do you go to crystals? Do you go to just literally everything? The mountains? I really want to know my purpose, so I'm going to go on a hike in the mountains. I mean, many, many, many people do. Another big question is, where am I going when I die? Is there any life after death? These are some pretty big, significant questions. The question that I have for you is, where do you go? What do you turn to when you're trying to seek out these questions? Here's my discovery with a lot of people. A lot of times whenever I ask people these questions, they, they don't really put the time and the energy into the pursuit of the knowledge of these questions. Most rarely turn to God's word. So we're turning to everything other than the author and the creator to tell us life's biggest questions. Instead of the one who designed everything, created everything with incredible intentionality, and who loves you, turn to everything else instead of our creator. I want to encourage you today to turn to God. Life is all about, it's a big way to start a statement, Life is all about letting God use you for his purposes, not using him for your purposes. Life is all about letting God use you for his purposes, not using him for yours. Many of you have a purpose that you've determined. My purpose is to do good and be good. Now, God, help me with my purpose. And God's like, you really think that you have it in you to be good? You really think that in your own morality, you think you're going to make good decisions in life? No. I'm not saying that everybody that's pursuing good is are bad people. I'm just saying they have the wrong source, that it's flawed, that the foundation is flawed. I'm saying that God has a bigger plan and purpose for your life than you do. And that so oftentimes we flip the script on God instead of just allowing God to use us for his purposes. Next, I want to encourage you to turn to God, but how do we turn to God practically? Do we go on a hike in the mountains? God, I'm going to walk, and I'm going to listen, and then God revealed to me my purpose. How many of you have ever been walking through the woods, and God just like was like, bam, here's the purpose for your life. Billboard on the side of the mountain. Marry that person. Take a step of faith to take that new job. I've never had that happen in my life. And I'm like, I'm, I'm looking for those big billboard sign moments. But really, God has spoken to us already. We just have to open up his words. He's given us very clear instructions of the purpose that he has for our lives. We just have to carve out the time in our day to open them up. And to hear from him. It's called God's word. It is God's words over the purpose of your life. How do you determine life's greatest questions? Well, they're all found in God's word. Where do we come from? God. How do we gauge morality? God. What's the purpose in my life? God. Where are we going? God. Spend time in heaven with God. And it's all found in his words in scripture. So again, where do you turn to? Whenever you're looking for answers to life's greatest questions, I want to encourage you to turn to God's word. Why is that the case? Even as a child, whenever I used to think about getting a job or pursuing a career or um, being successful, you know, this is, this is really kind of a strange thing to admit. I didn't share this with the morning. You know, so I'm, I'm strictly, this is just for you guys, you know. Going off the rails. 
Um, I was, as a child, I was pretty obsessed with being successful. And I kind of had it in my head that no matter what I did, I wanted to make a lot of money. I wanted to crush the competition. And I wanted to be super famous. Like, I just wanted to be a freaking rock star at whatever I did. This was when I was a kid. And so even in my mind, it didn't matter what I did. If I was, like, on a team, like, I was just a free, I was a fighter to be the best. And I said, no matter what, I'm going to be successful when I grow older. And even as a kid, in my pursuit of success, in the back of my mind, there was always this voice, this whisper in my head that would just say, it's not going to make you happy. It's not enough. And I would always wrestle with God and argue with God. I'd be like, and maybe it's because I saw a lot of the people that are around me that maybe didn't have a lot of money or that looked sad or I especially didn't want to be a preacher or a missionary because that life sucks. You're always poor. Your kids can barely put shoes on their feet. I never wanted that life. I never wanted this life, fam. <laughs> Somebody said preach. You said it. My wife. Oh, okay. Okay, you said. Okay, I got you. I wanted to be successful. I wanted to achieve great things. And even uh, growing up as a teenager, I would really wrestle with that because I felt like God just kept whispering over my life. If you pursue temporary things, you're going to get a temporary legacy. If you pursue temporary things, you're going to get temporary outcomes. If you pursue shallow endeavors, you're going to, it's going to result in a shallow life. And then, and then I always hated that because I was like, okay, I'll make you a deal. I'll pursue the kingdom, but make me rich too. <laughs> anybody? Anybody? Else? I'll, yeah, okay. Hey, I'll, per, I'll, I'll, I'll serve you and follow you plus. Plus health. Plus wealth. Plus fame. And the older I got, the more I began to see people that were healthy, wealthy, living for the next career opportunity, living for their second, third, fourth home, living for, you know, the blue check mark, whatever, living just to be popular. And they were some of the most miserable people I've ever met in my life the most sad people I've ever met, the most depressed people, constantly moving, constantly changing friends because they thought, well, I think I just couldn't find purpose because these friends are bad friends. Well, it's not the friends. It's not the career. It was your purpose. It was the pursuit of your heart. Like, what are you doing it for? What's the foundation? When I think of, like, our identity and the foundation and all of this, what I began to see over and over again, and, 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 and I actually somebody even just said this recently to me, and, and it, it just kind of shook me. I was just hanging out with, um, you know, people that are deep into compassion. I won't say their names, but deep into compassion ministry of some of the largest, one of the largest nonprofit compassion ministries in the world. I uh, was just sharing with them, and he was just sharing his heart for, the poor, sharing his heart for uh, those in poverty. And, and he said, uh, have you spent a lot of time with people in poverty? He said, uh, he said they're actually the, the, the pretty happy people in their day-to-day -day life. He's like, um, you know, in all of my life, even going traveling to these villages and spending time with people, it's like very rarely, if ever, do I hear of uh, someone who is deep into poverty ever commit suicide. He said, but I hear that a lot in other communities that I'm in where they have deep wealth and success. And that kind of shook me. I was like, why? Oh, my gosh. It's almost like the very thing that we're killing ourselves to pursue is the very thing that ultimately kills us in the end. And, and, and it's so true because what we end up doing, and the Scripture talks a lot about this, actually, with our identity and our purpose. And you're like, some of you are already checking out. You're like, he's... He's saying I shouldn't have a lot of money. No, I actually want you to have a lot of money. 
I do. I want you to be filthy rich. And I want you to tithe. And let's build the kingdom together, okay? Make millions and let's do this thing, okay? Stewardship. Stewardship. Those who sow sparingly will also reap sparingly. Anyways, we're not talking about tithes, okay? Uh, I want you to be rich, healthy, wealthy. I want you to have all of that. But, the, like, the imagery that I have when I think of somebody like that is an imagery of somebody, let's just say they're out in this great big lake. And this person is on this raft. And they're pursuing everything with this raft. And, and for a minute, they're like, man, I've built this giant raft, and it's taken me places. Isn't this a beautiful raft? Like, we're looking at it like it's a raft, and they're like, it's a yacht. You know what I'm saying? Like, I'm riding high on life. I got this yacht. Uh, it's not a yacht. But then over time, being out into the water, it's almost like the higher that they climb, the more they begin to sink. And I'm like, hey, man, you may, you may want to consider... Something other than that yacht out there, you're, you're about to drown. No, I'm living my best life. No unhappy days for me. And then I see them a week later, and they're like, no, bro, I'm, not, I'm actually not happy out here. Because what ends up happening is that thing that you thought was stable begins to crumble underneath you. That the very thing you put your identity in, that temporary thing, that shallow thing, and, and it begins to crumble and crush, and then... And then you're drowning and it's too late. But when I think of somebody that builds their lives on the purposes of God, when somebody that builds their life on the kingdom of God, that's a person that's building their life on a rock, a firm foundation that doesn't waver, that can't crumble. Have you ever met anybody when they've been working hard to pursue like their dream job and they lose their job and they're like, my life is over. Kill me now. I've invested the last 30 years of my life into this. Now I lost my job. Everything is done. And they go into deep, dark depression, have suicide. I was, I was just talking to somebody the other day, wildly successful. This person is probably worth, I mean, hundreds of millions of dollars. I mean, his granddad was, one of, uh, was the creator of KitchenAid. And he began to just share these dark thoughts. I mean, talk about how much money you made creating the KitchenAid, Okay. And he began to just share these dark thoughts with me. And he said, man, you would think. He said, I have literally everything. Yeah, I, have a be- I have a beautiful family. Unlimited wealth. Houses all over the world. You would think that I have the perfect life that I would feel happy and satisfied. He said, I've never been in a more dark place in my life. Because it wasn't built on God. It wasn't built on Jesus. It wasn't a firm foundation. I'm sorry, I just I keep going on. Keep going about this. Let's keep moving on. Let's keep moving on. I could go on. We must build our lives on eternal truths to truly experience eternal purpose. Not temporary, not shallow. I want to say this before I move on. I'm not saying your career is bad. Please hear me loud and clear. If you're like wildly trying to pursue your career and be the best engineer you can be, create the best apps, I think that's great. Is that your pursuit or is that your foundation? Are you doing it with God to make a difference, to have a purpose? Are you doing it just because you want it to satisfy your identity? There's a difference. I hope you hear that loud and clear. Ephesians 1, 11, 12 speaks to this. It says, it's in Christ that we find out who we are and what we are living for. Isn't that so opposite of how we like, treat our careers or, or treat our family or treat our relationships? It's actually in Christ that we find out who we are and what we're living for. Long before, long before we first heard of Christ and got our hopes up, he had his eyes on us had designs on us for glorious living. Part of the overall purpose, he is working out in everything and everyone. Ephesians 1, 11 through 12. There's three very specific 
things that I want to see from this passage. First is that you discover your identity and purpose in Jesus Christ alone. Not like I was trying to do and like Jesus Christ and wealth. Jesus Christ and a good 401k. Scripture actually says it's in Christ that we find out who we are. We like to have other things affirm who we are. We like other people to affirm who we are. And for some reason, we have a tendency to be afraid to go to God to truly find out who we really are. I don't know why. Maybe fear. Maybe hesitation. Maybe busyness. But I heard one time (coughs) that it's when you really approach God in a personal and intimate relationship that you discover who you are maybe for the first time. I know it's true for me. Number two, we see from this passage that God was thinking about you long before you were thinking about him. Long before we first heard of Christ, he had his eyes on us. Isn't that special? This isn't a God who's far away, who doesn't know what you have going on in your life. Before you were you, before you were conceived, before... Anything, he had his eyes on you. He had a plan, a purpose for your life. I find a lot of comfort in that. That his pursuit and his love for me far exceeds my pursuit and love for him. Number three, the purpose of your life fits into a much larger purpose that God has designed for eternity. Colossians 1.16 says, For through him God created everything in the heavenly realms and on earth. He made the things we can see and the things we can't see as thrones, kingdoms, rulers, and authorities in the unseen world. Everything was created through him and for him. I love how all of these passages that we read leave very wiggle room for plus. Everything was created through him and for him. Back to Romans. Therefore, whether we live or whether we die, our lives are to honor God and to make him Lord of our lives. Why did God create you? I think it's an important question to ask as we're trying to discover his purpose for our life. God's purpose for creating you was his love. He loved you. God, in heaven, infinite creator, all-knowing God, is wildly in love with you and is pursuing you and is drawing you. What if there was no God? I'm going to say this, and this is going to come off really harsh. And you're the best. Thank you. What if there was no God? Could we have purpose with no God? Could we have meaning with no God? Significance with no God? Could we have hope? For after we die, if there was no God. What if there was no God? Say, absolutely not. No purpose. No eternal purpose. No hope of afterlife. We would have no true north of our gauge of right or wrong. And unfortunately, this is where many people live in their life. And it's our hope here at Pinewood Church that we dedicate every breath, (laughs) every resource, uh, every bit of passion and energy that we have to meet people where they are and point them to Jesus so that they can truly discover that God loves them, that he desires a relationship for them, and that he has a plan and a purpose for their life. That's what we're going to do. That's our mission. You come to Grow Track, you're going to hear that, how we do that 50 different ways. That's what we do. Romans 12, 3, the final passage we'll look at tonight. It says, the only accurate way to understand ourselves is by what God is and by what he does for us, not by who we are and what we do for him. Seems so backwards. I'm going to discover myself as I serve you, God. You're going to reveal who you are, who I am in you. And I was like, well, no. 
Don't you just love how in every text God just releases more and more control out of your life? No, no, no. It's, it's actually you just look to me. Uh, you turn to me. You focus your attention on me. You read the words that I already gave you. Then you're going to find identity. Then you're going to find purpose, meaning, significance. Then you'll find the truth of, of what is right and wrong because the Holy Spirit will convict you. Then you'll know where you're going. Family, I cannot emphasize this enough. If it hasn't been already abundantly clear, there is no greater question that you can answer in your life than what am I here for? You're here to love and honor God. It's clear as that. Whether you live or whether you die, to make Lord Jesus Lord of your life. And I would love it if you would join in the mission that we have to do that together, to live out our purpose together, to use the gifts that we have together. There's a poem that I want to read to you by Russell Kelfer. I think it's a beautiful poem. It speaks to everything that we just talked about. It says this. It says, you are who you are for a reason. You are who you are for a reason. You're part of an intricate plan. You're perfect and precious, unique design. Called God's special woman or man. You look like you do for a reason. Our God made no mistake. He knit you together within the womb. You're just the way he wanted to make. You're just what he wanted to make. The parents you had were the ones he chose. And no matter how you feel, they were custom designed with God's plan in mind. And they bear the master's seal. No, that trauma you faced was not easy. And God wept that it hurt you so but it was allowed to shape your heart so that into his likeness you'd grow. You are who you are for a reason. You've been formed by the master's rod. You are who you are, beloved, because there is a God. There's a God that loves you. There's a God that has a plan and a purpose for your life. It's literally the If you would bow your head and close your eyes, I want to I want to close with this really briefly. I want to talk to two people in the room and I want to ask if you'd be honest with yourself. I think there's something powerful when there's a question asked and you have to raise your hand for it. It's almost a public acknowledgement that that's where I am. If you're here today and you've been pursuing a purpose, Maybe you've been standing on a shaky raft, a sandy island, something that is not rooted and grounded in Christ. And you've been saying, I've really been dedicating the majority of my time, my energy, and my resources into this endeavor. But tonight, I want to focus. I want to I focus and I want to reorient my life. And I want to make Jesus the foundation of my life. And I want to pursue him. If that's you, would you put your hand up? This is not a call to salvation. This is a call to you changing course in a direction that you've been going. Lots of hands everywhere. Everywhere. That's great. That's good. Look to Jesus. Look to Christ. If you're here and you're saying, I have never put my faith and trust in Jesus. I've never once looked to Christ and said, you are Lord of my life. I seek to honor you with my life and in my death. You are my Lord. You are my King. If you've never said that, then would you put your hand up as well? Just let me know who you are. Nobody else is looking but me. It's great. I want to pray a prayer with you, and this is just a prayer of acknowledging that Jesus is Lord. And I think it's good to pray this prayer corporately together often just to refocus our attention back on Christ to say, you're Lord of my life. I recognize your goodness over my life. I commit my, my ways to you, my thoughts to you. You are my purpose, Christ. So let's, if you agree with this prayer, would you pray this prayer out loud with me together? Say, Jesus, I acknowledge that I need you. 
I confess that I have lived with controlling my life. But I, tonight I want to let go. Father, forgive me for my sins. I trust you. I want to find my purpose in you. Thank you for giving me life. Thank you for saving me. In Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said, amen, amen. I think it's just good, fam. You can clap. I think it's just good to come before God, declare the truth of how we're sinners together, declare the truth of his grace and love over our life. Declare the truth that in him we can find life, love, hope, and ultimately purpose. Would you go ahead and stand to your feet? We're going to continue with a couple worship songs. I like to call these songs a response because this is an opportunity for us to not only sing and lift our voices, but to pray. And maybe, maybe there was one of you. I would, I would go as far as to say there's at least one of you that was not honest and did not raise your hand. That's okay. I want to ask you to do something even bigger. See, you had an opportunity. You could have just raised your hand and said, that was me. I want to ask you to do something bigger. We're going to have a prayer team that's down at the front. If that was you, I want you to come down and grab somebody and just say, hey, look, I've been building my life on this, and I want to build my life on God. Hey, I've been pursuing this as the greatest purpose for my life. I want it to be Christ. And there's something really special when you come and pray with somebody and then they pray over you, that you begin to experience freedom from that. And they begin to acknowledge that. I'm gonna go ahead and pray for you all right now. Our prayer team's gonna be on down in the front during this song of worship. Please come down, talk to somebody, pray for somebody. If you don't wanna talk to pr and pray with anybody, th this is, I'm gonna deem this just an altar of prayer. I've made many of my most significant life decisions kneeling at an altar like this before God. I think it's something powerful to it. It lets pretty much everybody know that we're all not okay, and that's okay, and that we need God. Let's pray. Father, we love you so much. Father, I pray that you would speak to us during this song. Father, I pray that those passages that we read today in Colossians 1, Romans 13, Father, Romans 14, whether we live, whether we die, Father, our call, our purpose in this life is to honor you make you Lord of our life, for you to have priority. So Father, I pray during this song of response that we would make a decision today, Father, to say that we trust you, that we love you, and that we pursue you. In Jesus' name, amen.